Alrighty then. This is not the fun lecture, like the principle of creation. Creation is fun. You know about the ideal, the possibility of love in the universe, the possibility of a supreme being. Here, we find out our condition. Unfortunately, we find our condition. But that's also the good news. Because if you go to a doctor, in order to get healed of something, you need to know what's wrong, correct? Hey, doc, I've got this weird malignant growth on my arm. Well, just put a Band-Aid on it. It'll be OK. Call me in the morning. Is that going to do it? No. I have to find out. I've got to dig down. Where'd that discoloration, where'd that dysfunction come from? Knowing where something comes from is halfway to the cure. Once you know what you're attacking, once you know the origin of something, then the resolution is right around the corner. Likewise, the fall of man. People have tried to figure out what's wrong with the world. Why can't I do what I want to do? St. Paul, a man who wrote 13 books of the Bible, shipwrecked twice for Christ, and ultimately decapitated, clearly a pillar of Christianity, lamented in Romans 7, with my mind I serve the law of God, but in my members another law is at work. Even he, St. Paul we call him, lamented that he couldn't break out of his sinful nature. For some strange reason, even he couldn't do it. So we shouldn't feel terribly bad that we find ourselves in the same position. We're in good company. <laughs> We're in very good company. Thank you so much. So this is the fall of man. Not a fun lecture, but an extremely exciting lecture if you're paying attention. I always say, seatbelts fastened, thinking caps on. Think, contemplate, allow yourself to be persuaded. I'm not saying just take it hook, line, and sinker, but think about what you're hearing because this is going to blow your mind if you're paying attention. It blew my, this is the day I met the Unification Church 37 years ago. Very interesting that I'm teaching this on this particular day. Let's see if I can get this thing going. Here we go. The origin of evil and suffering. A lot of people claim to know what the fall of man is. How did we get in the position we are where we can't break out? Nobody seems to be able to solve the problems of humanity. Some people think of solving the problems of humanity is cutting people's heads off, flying airplanes into buildings, blowing themselves up, beating themselves to death. I mean, whatever. But nonetheless, the greatest have come and gone for thousands of years, and no one's been able to nail it. No one's been able to say it. There's the problem. Let's take a look. What's the state of the world today? Confusion, despair, immorality, anger, war. You can add to this ad infinitum. That's not the point of the lecture. We're not going to just detail all the things that are wrong with the world. We want to find out where all this stuff came from. That's where we want to go. Do we know the cause of these problems? Do we know the solution? If we did, all the problems would be solved. Even the church. The church has been traditionally the place of comfort, of wisdom, of understanding, of strength, where people went when they had problems. But even the church now is struggling like crazy mad. The Christian church, the Catholic church, every church has all kinds of internal problems. There's amazing dissent even amongst churches. Irish Catholics and Irish Protestants are throwing bombs at each other in Ireland. Muslims and Jews are killing each other in the Middle East. Nobody can seem to... Resolve these deep, thousands of year old problems. How in the world are we going to resolve these things? They're so deep, so profound, so deeply held. We are right, you are wrong. We're going to heaven, you're going to hell. Everybody can't be right. Everybody can't be wrong. But even places where we used to go for comfort and counsel and, and hope are now even compromised. In order to find the solution, we need to know the cause. We've got to find out where this come from. We need to go to the root. Everybody, I'm very sorry to burst anybody's bubble. I'm very sorry. But this is, I'm included here. Everyone's in the midway position. We want to do the right thing, and many times we do. But often we don't. Sins of commission, sins of omission, the Catholic Church would say. 
There's sins of commission, things you do willfully wrong. And there's things that you negate or neglect to do. You really should help that old lady across the street. <laughs> you, know, you really should pick up that thing for the guy who just dropped it. But uh, you should give a little bit of money to that poor guy. Oh, uh, well. Uh, ultimately, we'd like to be, yes, I want to I wanna be everything, all things to all people. But we're just not for our own reasons. Everyone's got baggage. Let me tell you about baggage. You got, you got a couple hours? I can tell you about baggage. Fallen nature, we got self-contradiction. It's an evil world. Selfishness, fear, hate, opposition to God's way. Complete dysfunction in the world. So, we are the Holy Spirit Association for the Unification of World Christianity. We, we profess to be a Christian church. We believe in the Old and New Testament. We have an understanding of the Old and New Testament called the Divine Principle. So we're coming from a biblical perspective. And with that in mind, we want to examine the root story that Christians and Jews and Muslims uh, go to to understand the beginnings of humanity. And we're going to identify the characters in the biblical fall story. It's very important. Like, again, we're going to sources now. We're going to the beginning. So the biblical view of the root of sin is in Genesis 3. We have to identify our characters. There are several characters in the fall story that need to be clarified because they have not been clearly understood for thousands of years. First thing we have is a Garden of Eden. The Bible talks about a place that was built by God for man to live in. Number two, there are a couple of people there. There's Adam and there's Eve, apparently. There happens to be a serpent. According to the narrative, there's a serpent there as well. There's also a tree of life and a tree of the knowledge of good and evil and a fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that hung on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So these are our main protagonists. These are our, our characters in the story. And this is the, these are the characters that we're going to use to be able to understand what is the fall of man. Now, Genesis 2.17, God said unto the man, Do not eat of the fruit, for in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. <clears throat> Kick this down just to taste. So there you have it. The course of the fall, according to the narrative, the serpent tempted Eve, Eve tempted Adam, and they fell. So we have our characters, we have the course, now let's do some ID. One of the easiest characters to identify is the serpent. The serpent is one of the most easy characters to identify here. This serpent could talk. Interesting. Go down to PetSmart and ask for a talking snake. Please. Try it. <laughs> I'd like a talking snake, please. Okay, a little 911 here. This snake, interestingly enough, knew God's will. Wow, this is an unusual snake, don't you think? This snake deceived Eve. Now we have some ID coming. Revelation 12, 9 says, The ancient serpent, the devil Satan, was thrown down from heaven. Created. Wow, this tells us a whole bunch of things. Revelation was written in 95 AD by John on the Isle of Patmos. He's talking about an ancient serpent. So we're talking about a real old serpent. He's talking about the serpent of the Bible, of the Genesis story. He must be referencing that. The ancient serpent, the devil, Satan. So, wow, we've already ID'd him. He's a devil and Satan. He's an ancient serpent. He's a, de a devil and Satan. And he was created with a good purpose. If he's thrown down from heaven, what's he doing in heaven and being thrown out? It means he must have been created with a good purpose and turned to the dark side. He, now we've nailed gender. In just a couple of scriptures, we've got this guy pegged. He and his angels, he's also got a following. <laughs> wow, I, I just can't make this stuff up. In a court of law, I'm doing really well as a prosecutor. They were thrown down with him. He was a leader of angels, the devil and Satan. Isaiah 14, 12, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. Lucifer, wow, we've got him nailed. We have identified the serpent, and we didn't have to invent a thing. The Bible tells us exactly who this serpent is. 
it's Lucifer, the angel. Lucifer, L-U-C, Latin prefix for light. In Spanish, luz, L-U-Z, luz, light, the angel of light. There are three archangels, Lucifer, the angel of intellect, Michael, the angel of will, Gabriel, the angel of emotion. Gabriel came to Mary. Gabriel came to Zechariah. Gabriel came to Elizabeth and Joseph and let them know that they were going to have children. That's good news. That's, a, that's an emotional angel. That's an, ama- a, a, an angel delivering wonderful tidings. Michael's always been associated with the fighter, the will. Those angels represent the three characteristics of God, intellect, emotion, and will. So we've got this guy nailed. The serpent is a symbol for the archangel Lucifer. Wow, interesting. If this guy is so easily nailed, we've still got <laughs> many other characters to go. What's the fruit? That's another one that's easily identified. Is it literal or symbolic? How many believe it was an apple? Show of hands. <laughs> you guys are smart, you know. You ask any 10 Christians or Jews for that matter, what was the the sin of the fall? Oh, they ate the apple. They ate the apple in the garden. Do you know the word apple doesn't appear in the book of Genesis one time? Ain't happening. That's just a myth. That's just been passed down. It was a fruit, so what's the most easily identifiable fruit or most favorite or common fruit? Well, it had to be an apple. Okay. We'll, We'll settle there. It says nothing about an apple. It says the fruit that hung on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It does not identify it. So we have to ask ourselves, is it literal or symbolic? Hmm. Well, first we've got to ask ourselves a question. Does the God of love test with death? Thou shalt not eat the fruit, for in the day you eat of it, you will surely die? Do you tell your children, Junior, if you eat that cake, I'm going to kill you. Even the worst parent doesn't do that. But the Bible is very clear. James 1.13, let no one say when he's tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted to do evil, nor does he tempt any man. Some people say it was a test. In the King James Bible, the word tempt and test are interchangeable. God does not test like that with the punishment of death upon failure. Even the worst parent doesn't do that. So it has to be something else. There's something going wrong. There's something weird here. Jesus himself said in Matthew 15, 11, not that which goes into the mouth defiles a man, but that which comes out, this defiles a man. So Jesus himself is saying, nothing you can eat. God created the world, and it was what? Bad? It was all good. There's not a fruit around that you can possibly eat that's going to defile you, because everything that was created was good. There was no evil fruit. It's something else. It's something else. Not that which goes into the mouth defiles a man, but that which comes out. Jesus said, I can't make this stuff up. (laughs) Even animals avoid poisonous food. Even animals know what not to eat and what to eat. Birds will avoid certain berries. Animals will avoid certain trees and poisonous uh, 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 herbs and things like that. Fruit has never been valued more than life. I love watermelon. (laughs) I really like watermelon a lot. And if you gave me the most delicious, succulent, organically grown, scientifically produced watermelon, presented it to me and said, here it is. Here's a knife, here's a fork, have at it. But as soon as you eat that thing, you're going to drop dead. (laughs) No matter how much I love my watermelon, I'm not going to eat that watermelon at the price of my life. I don't care how juicy, I don't care how sucking, how wonderful, how genetically engineered. Because I know as soon as I put my face in that thing, I'm going to drop dead. I'll say, thank you very much for your offering, but uh, I'll pass on this. Fruit has never been bad. There's nothing in the Garden of Eden that could have possibly tempted Adam and Eve to the point where they would have been willing to risk their life to eat it. Nothing physical. There's something else. There's something else going on here. Five. The death caused by this fruit kills generation after generation. By virtue of your birth, you inherit the problem of the fall of man. You can't get out of it any more than the man in the moon. You can will your way out of it. Oh, I don't want this original sin. I don't want the effects of the fall. There's nothing you can do about it, unfortunately, in yourself. 
the death caused by this fruit, if I can eat apples all day long, but my son will not suffer the, the consequences of me eating that apple. In fact, he might be a little healthier because my genetic structure will be better <laughs> if I eat healthy things. But something about this fruit kills generation after generation after generation. So, wow, I think we're hot on the case. And in a court of law, I think the judge and the jury are all ears. Well, press on. All right? Literal fruit, well, the, fr the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil hung on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Huh. Well, what is this? What is this? What are these two trees? Well, in Proverbs 13, 12, the Bible says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is... A tree of life. It says there's a tree of life in the Garden of Eden and a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Genesis 3.24. What happened to that tree of life? It says, it, and God placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. There's something barring access to that tree of life. There's no access to this. But in Revelation 22, 14, it says, Blessed are they that wash their robes, that they might have the right to the tree of life. Apparently, there is the tree of life. The tree of life is barred. At the end of biblical history, it is opened once again. There's access to this tree of life. Adam's potential was to become a person who fulfills the ideal of creation. What was the first blessing? Of the three blessings, be fruitful. Be fruitful. It's, it's a, an analogy to a tree. God is saying to Adam and Eve in Genesis 1.27, God created them in his image, created them, male and female created them. In Genesis 1.28, the very next verse, God says, and be fruitful, multiply, and have dominion. A tree cannot multiply until it becomes what? Mature. You can yell at a tree, you can kick the tree, you can hit it with a baseball bat. Come on, give me some fruit, man. Yeah. A tree is not going to give forth its fruit until it is completely mature. Then what happens? Very interesting phenomena. In an apple tree, they just simply drop off the tree very naturally go into the ground break open the seeds come out the birds take them the birds spread them sometimes the, the seeds just go directly into the ground and another tree springs up a very natural process God is saying to Adam and Eve be fruitful in other words grow to maturity and then multiply very interesting people try to run those together be fruitful and multiply same thing same thing no it's not in the Bible there's be fruitful comma multiply, comma, and have dominion. There's three very separate commands. God does not waste words. So, it's not about trees, but about the first human ancestors. The tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil are Adam and Eve. The potential for Adam is to become a tree of life. This is a symbolic metaphor for Adam in perfection. The tree right next to him, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The fall came through Eve. Sorry. Sorry, ladies. Don't take it personal. <laughs> Whatever you do. It's about the first human ancestors. That's the, the last symbology we're trying to figure out. We still have the fruit to go, but we've identified our serpent. We've got Adam and Eve. We've identified our two trees. Now we've got to nail this fruit. It's a symbol. It's a symbol for something else, and we're going to get to that. So the course of motivation, as we know from the biblical story, the fall went from Lucifer, the angel, to Eve. Remember, from the principal creation story, we have a physical and spiritual body. And Paul verifies this in 1 Corinthians 15, 44. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. He's saying there's two distinct entities in the human condition. You have a physical body and you have a spiritual body. So what happened? Now, Lucifer doesn't have a physical body. He is only a spiritual being. Before the fall of man, they can see each other like we can see each other right now. The spirit world is a completely different vibration, a completely different quality of existence 
and we're only cut off uh, uh, to it because of the fall of man. We don't perceive the spiritual realm because of the fall of man. Those two worlds were ripped apart at the fall, and we'll talk about that. So, the course was e uh, Lucifer to Eve, then Eve in the physical body. Remember, she's got a spirit, spiritual body, and a physical body. She now brings this in the physical world and tempts her husband. Her actually husband-to-be. She's not married yet. She's not married yet. They're still brother and sister. Right? So now she brings it into the physical world. They both fall. Now we have a fallen situation. Spiritual and physical are ripped apart. So what does that look like? What does the spiritual fall? Let's dissect the spiritual fall. Here's God. Now, God has created the angelic realm prior to man. The angelic realm and the spiritual world are created prior to man to assist God in the creation of the physical world, to create an environment for mankind. Who's the last person to appear in the evolution of time? Man is the last one. The whole dinosaur age came and went millions and millions of years ago, but we remain. For some reason, we remain. We send rockets to the moon. We write declarations of independence. We do amazing things because we are the last ones on the evolutionary scale. But the angelic realm was created prior to man to assist God in the creation of the universe. So Lucifer is the archangel of intellect. For some reason now, Lucifer is tempting Eve. We would contend that Lucifer was assigned by God for the education of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve are God's children. They have to be educated somehow. God doesn't have arms and legs. He's got representatives, though. Remember, we said before the fall, they could see each other as clearly as we're seeing each other right now. After the fall, those two worlds came apart. So, representing the, the internal character of God, intellect, emotion, and will, the three archangels are leading, apparently, according to Revelation, Lucifer was in charge of a third of the angels, and they fell with him. That means the other two-thirds uh, two are with Gabriel and Michael. Now, another thing that's really important, forever lose the concept of, of angels with wings and, and floating around, hovering a few inches over, off the ground, and Lucifer with a tail and a pitchfork and red and horns and all that. C.S. Lewis said that one of Satan's greatest tricks is to get people to believe he doesn't exist. And that's one way he does it. Nobody believes in a crazy devil with horns and a red outfit on and, and a pitchfork and a tail. It's very easy to caricature Satan that way. Satan is a malevolent presence in the universe. What other kind of presence would make a parent kill their child or make someone drive an airplane into a building? Some kind of malevolent presence some kind of evil presence that makes people do despicable acts against each other. So, Lucifer is enjoying the fellowship of God. We don't know how long. We, there's no indication in the scriptures how long the angelic realm was around before man appeared. It could have been, chances are, billions of years. These guys could have been with, with God for billions. They could have been for two months. We don't know. There's no way to know. But we do know that the angelic realm was created prior to the coming of man. So suddenly, Adam and Eve come along. These are now the children of God. These are not spiritual beings. These guys are lucky. They've got spirit and body. These guys are only created with a spirit. They don't have a physical body. Adam and Eve now get to enjoy the physical world, which God has labored for, at this point, billions of years to create this idyllic living environment for mankind. Why is it we appreciate the sun? Why is it that trees interact with us, give us oxygen, we give them poison, and they give us oxygen back? There's a thousand, hundred, thousands difference of fruits, vegetables, nuts, things in the, in the creation that happen to work for man. Oranges are just handheld. And then you peel the skin off, and there's individual bite-sized, human size. They're not elephant-sized. They're not rhinoceros-sized. They're not giraffe-sized. Handheld fruits are human size for some strength, and they fit right in the human hand. It's amazing. God prepared this entire environment for man to enjoy. And these guys come to lead the charge. So what happens now? In the spiritual fall, 
Lucifer, for some strange reason, seduces Eve in some kind of illicit relationship in spirit. Now, remember, we already assigned gender to Lucifer. He's a guy. Eve's a girl. And from the principle, opposites attract. Why is it that Lucifer didn't go to Adam? Huh. Can't. He's positive. Positives repel. That the temptation didn't go from Lucifer to Adam because they, they naturally don't attract each other. But he is attracted to Eve. Eve is the first woman on earth. She must have been terribly attractive in many, many ways. The first daughter of God. So what's happening? Remember, Lucifer's been enjoying the fellowship of God for we don't know how long. Could have been a year. Could have been a million years. It could have been a billion years. Suddenly God decides to create children. Remember, these guys aren't perfected. If Lucifer was perfected, he could not have tempted Eve. If Adam and Eve were perfected, they couldn't have fallen. These are all entities that are on their way to perfection. They're growing to perfection. They have not achieved perfection yet. They have free will. God has instilled in all of these characters free will. So, again, remember, we have spiritual and physical world. In the spirit world, again, before the fall, let me see, if I, I'm going to get this back here. Again, Lucifer is naturally attracted to Eve and has some kind of illicit relationship in spirit. In psychoanalytic terms, this is called sibling rivalry in one sense. Lucifer, again, has been enjoying the fellowship of God for we don't know how long. These guys show up and right away, it sets up, in an imperfected being, a sense of jealousy. He's not quite perfected yet, and the possibility of jealousy can happen here. He's feeling a percentage of l less love than he's been enjoying for we don't know how long. In contrast with the kind of love that God is showing Adam and Eve, he's feeling less love. There's no other reason to uh, account for why Lucifer would even bother coming to Eve except to make up for something that he felt he was losing. The quality of life, the love, the nature and the quality of the love that God is showing Adam and Eve is different than the love God is showing Lucifer. Lucifer is a servant. This is God's flesh and blood. God loves Lucifer exactly, precisely the same as he always did from the time he was created. But now, God's children are here. So that's the, the only way we can account for this kind of horizontal movement is Lucifer's trying to make up for something he's not feeling or something he's lacking. Remember, it's physical and spiritual world. And this has precedent in, in the Old Testament. Uh, in Genesis 19, two angels came to Sodom at even. Lot sat in the gate. Angels come to Sodom, and they said, they turned him in, entered his house, made him a feast, before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house around, both old and young, people from every quarter, and they called unto Lot and said to him, where are the men which came into you this night? Angels are visiting Lot in Sodom. Bring them out unto us that we may know them. And then Lot went out the door and said, I pray you, brethren, do not do so wickedly. The people in Sodom wanted to have a sexual relationship with angels that had just visited Lot. So apparently this is, this is actually possible, according to scripture, an interaction between physical and spiritual beings. So it has some precedent. So what was the ideal? Adam and Eve were to grow through three stages of growth in the indirect dominion of God, where they're responsible for their growth. God gives them a commandment, do not eat. Don't eat of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. That is going to guide them through this period. God has imbued us all with free will. We actually have free will. It's, it's a difficult concept to think that the God of the universe that called worlds into being, incredible, the complexity of the universe, instills in his creation, in us, the ability to say no to him. It's really an astounding concept, really. But... They have this responsibility in the indirect dominion where they're responsible for their growth. 
ideally, they should not eat that fruit, whatever that fruit. We haven't nailed that fruit yet. We're getting there. Once they've successfully resisted that temptation, they would have punched through this level into perfection, and then they would have fulfilled the purpose of creation. Be fruitful, multiply, have dominion, and they would have started their family centered on God, free of Lucifer's invasion. They would have been completely intact. They would have made their four position foundations according to the principle, centered on God. Adam and Eve would have had a perfected baby. They would have started a perfected humanity. But as we know, that did not happen. And the whole of humanity is now infected with original sin. And again, that's, that, that's what we can't break out of. We're stuck. So the physical fall, the second part of the fall of man was the physical fall. The spiritual fall we've taken care of. Now, these guys are already fallen. They're already cut away from God. Now Eve, the Bible says that her eyes were open and she knew good and evil. And she went to her husband and had an illicit relationship in body and spirit. We still haven't nailed that. What is that relationship? What in the world could that be? Well, again, here's that positive negative thing. Lucifer is naturally attracted to Eve. Positive and negative. Eve is attracted to Adam. Positive and negative. But there's something wrong with this relationship. There's something not quite above board on this thing. And this goes back to free will. How could this happen? How could the fall of man happen in the presence of an almighty, omniscient, om omnipresent God? All knowing, all wise, all everything. How in the world could such a scenario happen in the presence of almighty God? Well, here we are as fallen man. God's will meets our free will. If we fulfill that will, this is, this is, this is the, one of those thinking cap moments. Here in Deuteronomy it says, And if you shall come to pass, if you shall hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and do all his commandments which I commanded thee, the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. He's talking to Israel. The Lord will set you on high above all nations of the earth. It says you will be the head and not the tail. If, 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 if thou shalt. However, if that's not done, same chapter, different verse, but, wow, but it shall come to pass, if thou will not hearken, all these curses shall come upon thee. And that's what happened. So this shows very clearly that nothing is in concrete. We do truly have free will on the individual level, the societal level, the national level, the global level. We have free will. We can choose. Amazing. The God of the universe leaves the choice to you. Now the interesting part is we're not just limited to yes we can, no we can't. God knows 360 degrees of all the possibilities. I can stand up. I can sit down. I can go get a drink. I can throw this at Suyapa. I can do all kinds of things. God knows the entire panoply, 360 degrees of all the possibilities. God isn't just limited to yes and no. There's an awful lot of maybes around. God is far more powerful and far more amazing than we ever previously imagined. God knows the entire 360 degrees of everything that can happen at any given moment. It's almost terrifying to know that kind of power. God knows all the possible choices we might make and is prepared for each and every one, but our choices are not predetermined. Some people say, oh, you're destined for heaven or hell. Well, if that's the case, I'm going to put my feet up and relax. It doesn't matter what I do. I'm destined to go to heaven or hell. There's nothing I can do about it. Why try? Why bother? It's impossible. It is entirely up to us. God entrusts that with us to make that decision. So this is important to understand. Free will. All these characters have free will. Lucifer, Gabriel, Michael, Adam, Eve. They've all, and Lucifer especially. <laughs> he's the guy that's really leading the charge on this thing. So what then was the fall of the angel and the fall of human beings. Well, let's look at the angel sin. We, we talked about the course of motivation. It did come spiritually first and then physically second. What was the angel sin? Jude 1, 6 and 7. I can't make this stuff up. This is right out of the Bible. The angels which kept not their first estate, even as Sodom and Gomorrah, we talked about that in Genesis, and the cities about them 
in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. Clearly saying that interaction, sexual interaction between humans and angels was possible. Remember, the angel has a spiritual body as solid as this. Before the fall, interrelationship between Eve's spiritual body and Lucifer's spiritual body was very, very much possible and happened. Illicit sexual relationship. Lucifer seduced Eve in a spiritual sexual relationship which infects humanity today. That's the spiritual side. That's why our spirits are fallen. We don't have perfected spirit. We're not one with God. It's not easy to be one with God. It takes incredible effort to overcome the physical body, as Paul said. With my mind, I serve the law of God, but in my members, another law is at work making me captive to the law of sin. What's the human sin? It involves the sexual parts. She took the fruit and did eat and gave to her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them were opened, and they knew they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons, and covered themselves and hid from God. Now, wait a second. Hold on just a second here. Genesis 2.25, they're naked and unashamed in the Garden of Eden. In Genesis 3.7, suddenly, they're aware of their nakedness. They sewed fig leaves together and covered their lower What are they covering their lower parts for? If they're eating an apple, yes, and they did spit the apple upon the ground. There's nothing like that. They did throw the apple far away, henceforth. They hid the apple behind their backs. Nothing like that. The first thing they did was try to hide from God because they knew what they did. They sinned through their lower parts. God said, be fruitful, then multiply. Not multiply and then become fruitful. What's the biggest problem in the world today? Kids having what? Kids. Children having children. 14, 15-year-old kids having babies. What are they going to offer their children? Nothing. Zero, zip, not a drug abuse, crime. Same thing here. God said, be fruitful. Grow to perfection first. You have something to give to your children. Become the image of God. So then when your child is born, they will see God in mom and dad. God said in Genesis 1.27, he created them in his image, male and female. The image of God is masculine and feminine. God is not just an old man in heaven throwing down bolts. God is our parent. Ideally, husband and wife should embody those two characteristics. So when the child grows up, they don't have to go any further than mom and dad to see the image of God. But if mom and dad never reached that point, what happened with Adam and Eve's first children? The elder killed the younger. Evidence, there's something wrong. There's something genetically wrong. I covered my sin as Adam did by hiding my iniquity in my bosom. The crime of the first human ancestor is an illicit sexual relationship outside the blessing of God. Do not leave this room saying the unification church is against sex. Just stop. Don't do it. That's not the truth. We're saying that illicit love, the abuse of physical love, is the cause of crime. It's the cause of evil. It's in the blood. That's why we're born into it. Nobody's born without sin. They say nobody's perfect. It's true. <laughs> nobody's perfect. Why? Because we're locked into a condition by virtue of our birth. From the first human ancestors. A tree reproduces by its fruit. The fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The fruit hung on a tree. Well, we've identified those two trees. It's Adam and Eve. They were ashamed of their nakedness only after the fall. Here, they're naked and unashamed. Hee hee hee. La di da di da. And then in 3 7, whoa! Oh no! Ah, oh, this is bad. <laughs> oh. Who told you you were naked? God says. Oh, well, it's that serpent. That, he did it. So. Oh. The way of the adulterer is this. She eats Old Testament parlance, wipes her mouth and says she has done no wickedness. The adulterer, she eats. To eat of the fruit was an Old Testament term for having an illicit sexual relationship. 
You are of your father the devil. Why would Jesus say such a thing in John 8, 48? You are of your father the devil. He's insinuating a genetic link to the devil. How does that happen outside of sexuality? <laughs> I told you it's not fun. It's not fun to know where we come from. But, again, we're trying to heal an illness. It's not fun to hear the doctor say, you're really sick, man. You need a new liver, dude. It's not fun. However, it is exciting to know, I might be able to live with a liver transplant. <laughs> to know in biblical terms means to have a sexual relationship. I can't make this stuff up, man. Adam knew his wife in Genesis 4.1. Would, could we say he had knowledge of his wife? Is that too bold of a pronouncement? And she bore him a son, Cain. It says again, 16 verses later, Adam knew his wife again and bore him a son, Abel. Had knowledge of the tree of the knowledge. You get where I'm going with this? <laughs> Literal fruit, fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. No, no, no. It's a symbol for the sexual love of Eve. There's no other accounting for why we're locked into the, the, the condition of sin. It is a genetic problem. It's a genetic It's in the blood. It's in the blood. Do not eat the fruit from the day you eat it, you will surely die. Did Adam die on that day? He lived 900 years, thank you very much. What kind of death is that? God promised the day you eat it, the day you eat of it, you will die. But he lived a long, ripe old age. He died spiritually. The spiritual and physical worlds ripped apart. Spiritual and physical. <laughs> because the violation of that sacred trust between spiritual and physical was broken. It's broken to this day. And requires direct intervention of God. Human responsibility. We fulfill it. Good happens. We don't. Evil happens. You're either destined for heaven or hell. Well, I'm, I'm going to sleep. Wake me up when it's over. No, 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 no. God said, if you obey, you'll be blessed. If you don't, you will be cursed. Man, that just, oh, that's like neon lights. Like, well, you better get it together, pal, really fast. <laughs> you have a decision to make. You, you have a hand in your destiny. You have a direct hand in becoming like God. So, how can this happen? How in the world can this happen? Again, in the presence of an omnipotent, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving God, how in the world can all this horror happen? It's tragic, but it's easy to understand. Frankly. God made the force of principle less than the force of love. The force of love is the strongest force in the universe and more closely represents the nature of God than any force in the universe. The force of love animates the universe. Everything God does is from the force of love. Everything God does. God is like, an, like a nuclear generator of love in the universe. Right? But the force of principle, law, thou shalt, thou shalt not, is actually less than the force of love. That's why Adam and Eve could fall. God made the force of love stronger than the force of law. Even if God says don't eat, the force of love, if they don't follow the commandment, they'll have nothing to hold them back. So, how does God compensate for this? God is so brilliant. It's just amazing. The force of principle plus the commandment, don't eat. God gives them a way out. You don't have to eat the fruit. You can grow to perfection. You can resemble me in every, every aspect possible. The force of principle, the law, plus the commandment, is greater than the force of love. If they, it would have been better for them to make a little sign, like a little wire, like a coat hanger, with a little sign that says, don't eat the fruit, and wear that until they became adults. It would have been better to do that to remind themselves, oh gosh, she really is good looking, but... Man, I, oh, I just can't touch that. Leave it alone. Lucifer, same thing. He knew the, the principle. The Bible says he tempted her with that. He knew what the principle was. Don't you know that if you eat the fruit, you'll be just like God? He knew very well. 
he knew very well what the score was, what was going on. So, if they obey the commandment, that's all they had to do. Keep reminding themselves, I, I know you want to have a relationship with me, but you know what Adam could have said. You know what God said. No, 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 a thousand times no. Even if Lucifer and Eve fall, Adam can say no. Adam is still intact. He becomes the first Messiah. He becomes the Messiah for Eve. Eve gets restored and saved through Adam. If he retains his integrity, then he goes to God and says, God, something happened between Lucifer and, and Eve. I don't know what it is, but I don't feel good about it. He's just a kid. He doesn't know. But there's something wrong. They, they look really shook up over there. And God could have come and said, okay, well, let's sit down, put Adam on his knee, and all right, tell me all about it. And they work it out right there. Okay, let's get this together. Okay, Eve, you've got to come to Adam. And there would have been some very small, very quick course of restoration for them. It would have been a little speed bump. And then they're right back on the path to growth. All is not lost, but Adam gave in. Adam gave in. The Bible talks about Jesus being the last Adam. The last Adam. Adam is still intact. He could have just said, Eve, no, a thousand times no. You know that's wrong. Why are you coming to me with this? There's no record of it. It didn't happen. And here we sit thousands of years later <laughs> talking about what happened. <laughs> Original responsibility. First human ancestors were supposed to grow through three stages of growth. Formation, growth, indirect dominion, obeying the commandment. They know they fell. They created their family outside the realm of principle. They failed their responsibility. They gave in to the temptation. They could have waited. We don't know. It could have been one more hour. Wait one more hour. Lucifer, get away from me for one more hour. It, she could have been minutes away. Who knows? And then they could have pressed on and created their family, centered on God, and we'd be enjoying the kingdom of heaven 6,000, 7,000 years later. We wouldn't even be here. We wouldn't even be talking about this. We'd just be living in heaven. Just let your man. I love to think about heaven. What's heaven going to be like? What did Jesus say? Eye has not seen, ear has not heard the things that God has prepared for them that love. There are stories of people that have gone into the spirit world after dying, after death experiences. Look at near death experiences, NDEs, near death experiences. They say there's colors over there that you've never seen. There's sounds you've never heard. But Jesus said that. Forget the near NDEs. Jesus said that. Eye has not seen. Ear has not heard. Why? We've never been there. Adam and Eve never went there. So as a result, we haven't been there either. But this is what could have happened. The kingdom of heaven on earth effortlessly. Be fruitful, then multiply, then have dominion. Very effortless, very natural process would have unfolded. Right? Then we'd come into the direct dominion of God. We'd be enjoying the, the full attention, the full love, the creativity, the abundance of God, uninterrupted, uncorrupted. Human responsibility. Hmm. What is human responsibility? You would think, well, people say, God's in control of everything. God's in control of everything. Oh, really? Was he in control yesterday? <laughs> When our British friend got beheaded, I don't think God had anything to do with that, myself. There's something that God is not in control of. It's humanity. Again, we have free will. We can cut people's heads off if we want. God can't step in. Not that he won't. He can't. God can. That's one place that God, the God of the universe, cannot violate his own principle when he created your free will. It's like a room he created in your spirit, and then he gives you the key to it. Even God can't get in there unless he's invited. That's why you see in the Christian world say, resigning your will to God, giving over your will to God. That's the only way that God can have give and take with us and take over is if we invite him in. What did Jesus do? He came to the door and what did he do? Did he batter it down with a ram? <clears throat> telephone pole? I stand at the door with my telephone pole. No, he says, he knocked. Asking permission to come. The Son of God is asking permission to come in. In my book, 
The Son of God walks in whenever he feels like it. But even the Son of God knocks on the door. Ask, seek, knock. A-S-K, ask, ask, seek, knock. It'll be opened unto you. Even the God of the universe. May I come in? Can you imagine the God of the universe created Antares. Antares is 800 times the size of our own sun. But just a little tap. God's portion of responsibility is 95%. It's actually 99.99%. But for relative terms, God does everything. God creates this entire universe, dumps mankind right down the middle of it. All we need is our relatively small 5% portion of responsibility. Together, God's will is accomplished. The Old and New Testament is full of God asking man to cooperate with him in the fulfillment of his will. Because God, if God could do it by himself, he would have done it thousands of years ago. It's very clear God is not in control. God is in control of the general direction that history is moving in, but God requires the constant intervention of man, the cooperation of man in accomplishment of his will. So the premature and illicit sexual relationship of the first human ancestor is the origin of human evil. Unprincipled love is considered among the greatest of sins by major religions. Islam, Judaism, Christianity all consider adultery a very, very serious sin. Next to murder, that's, <laughs> that's as bad as it gets. In Islam, even today, they still stone people to death for adultery. And by the way, anybody familiar with Paramahansa Yogananga, the Self-Realization Fellowship? This gentleman here, I just happened to got his two-volume uh, series called The Second Coming of Christ, and I just randomly flipped to one section, weirdly enough, and this is what he said. God warned them not to eat of the fruit in the midst of the garden, Genesis 3.3. That fruit was the sensual touch of sex in the middle of the bodily garden. When Adam and Eve succumbed to temptation and ate of that fruit, embraced each other in a lustful way, they were driven out of the Eden of spiritual consciousness. So we're not the only ones to think that this is the case. We're not the only one. We're not the oddball guy here. Mother Ann Lee, co-founder of the Shakers, had the same revelation. While Ann, for her testimony against fleshly lust, whose war against the soul, was imprisoned in Manchester, England, she saw Jesus Christ in open vision, who revealed to her the most astonishing views this means astonishing. It must be something new, something unusual, and divine manifestations of truth in which she had perfect and clear sight of the mystery of iniquity, the mystery of sin, the root and foundation of all human depravity and the very act of transgression committed by Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. She believed that the fall of man was sexual malfeasance between Adam and Eve. This group doesn't marry. They don't get married for that reason. They just get new members, but they're, all, they're almost, they're almost a, a, a dying faith now. No, they just, they just don't marry. <laughs> they don't have any relationships. They witness to new people who join their faith, but they never create children. <laughs> they make really great furniture, by the way. Yes, they do. They actually, they, yeah. Yeah, and they make, they make really incredible furniture that is thousands and thousands of dollars for just a simple chair. It's, they're so expertly crafted. Uh, they're, they're really amazing w with the uh, wood products and things like that. Sexual revolution equals infidelity. Leads to family breakdown. Yeah, eat, drink, and be merry, but oh, tomorrow, divorce court. <laughs> Not so good. Key to the rise and fall of nations. Strong family immorality. A nation is strong. Once that begins to erode, nation declines. Evidence? Is there a track record? Yes, there is. The Greek and Roman empires. Before Christ, there was not a single uh, incidence of divorce in the Roman Empire. After that, it took them 300 years to be taken over by the Goths, the Germans from the north. Destroyed. The mightiest nation in the history of mankind destroyed in a matter of years because they had rotted so terribly from the inside. Gladiatorial games, feeding people to the lions, uh, uh, persecuting Christians. Nero lit his court in 64 AD with burning Christians. Absolutely unbelievable how such a great society, how the mighty have fallen, as they say. Consequences of human fall. Everyone is in that unfortunate midway position, myself included. 
I, I tossed myself right in there with them. I might even have an extra dose myself. The corruption of love. The initial misuse of love has perpetuated and come down through history in self-centered individuals, dysfunctional families, and a completely dysfunctional world. We don't know what the heck's going on now. The world is a mess. Pick up a newspaper, go to Drudge Report, <laughs> and, and see how fast the world is falling apart. Unbelievable. And it goes all the way back to the fall of man. Fall of nature, ignorance, false tradition, false love, false lineage. Men want to marry men. Women want to marry women. Everything's upside down. Parents killing their children. Children killing their parents. <laughs> I mean, everything's inside out and upside down now. Nobody knows which end is up. Paul took it a little bit step further in 2 Corinthians 4, 4 and said Satan is the God of this world. Satan dominates all these systems. God certainly isn't dominating. If God was dominating, we'd have the kingdom of heaven. Everybody would be happy and fulfilled. There would be nobody going to hungry. There wouldn't be war. There wouldn't be people shooting each other, committing suicide. A thousand people are going to jump out of a building today somewhere on the earth or shoot themselves or drown themselves or overdose on something. A thousand people a day decide no sense in living anymore. Satan's activity in human society. How does this perpetuate? How does the activities of Satan perpetuate in the physical world? Well, Satan or Lucifer. See, Lucifer is the nice name <laughs> for the archangel. After his fall, he was renamed Satan. So remember, he fell with a third of his angelic realm. They all fell with him. They like, yeah, we like this guy. Yeah. And he's kind of fell with him. We don't want to mess around with, with Satan. He's a lot of fun. He's more fun than these other guys. So they become evil spirits. People who die in the physical world who are evil, the Hitlers, the Maos, the child molesters, the murderers, they're in there too, having fun with Satan. <laughs> and they affect, remember, we have a physical and spiritual body. You see people running around, uh, uh, I'm Napoleon, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, because they're being affected by evil spirits. Paul said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We wrestle against spiritual forces, wickedness in high places. The problem is we can't see it. If we could see it, we'd want to shoot it. But we can't see it. That's the problem. But it's a very real presence. Paul said, guard your minds and hearts in Christ Jesus. Guard your minds. Why? Because your mind is on, under constant attack. If you don't watch out, you will be taken over. The spirit was just looking for opportunities like this to find a weak spirit to dominate them to do something crazy. How does Jeffrey Dahmer kill 33 people and eat some of them? Something wrong in the spirit. Something in his mind is having give and take with this side rather than God's side. That's why we have to be diligent, pray, study, hang out with people of like mind, good people. Do the right thing. Do the right thing. So this is what happens. The spirit world affects people with weak spirit in the physical world, and that's how sin continues. That's how evil perpetuates. What is sin? There's four different types of sin. Original sin, of course, everyone has that. We're just born into it by the human condition. We have a connection to the original sin. Sorry. I'm <laughs> I said this is not a fun lecture. <laughs> it's not a fun. But again... It's good to know the truth. What did Jesus say? You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. It's a promise. It's a promise. You will know the truth, the truth will set you free. At least you know. You know. You don't have to wonder. Why is it I can't do the right thing? Why is I have such a hard time doing the right thing? Or whatever. Whatever your problem might be. You might have a mental problem. You might have a physical problem. Any number of problems. They all have their root here. Hereditary sin. Ancestral sin. Sometimes alcoholics are generations. My grandfather was an alcoholic. He died an inveterate alcoholic. Luckily, fortunately, my mother was not and I am not. For some reason, we stopped that. It didn't cascade down. But many times, things like that cascade down generation after generation. Drug addiction, alcohol addiction, uh, perversion, murder, God knows what. Collective sin. And uh, collective sin like 
uh, a, a kind of a 